Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. Good morning. You get me today. And I'm glad. Because I've had something on my mind, a scripture I've been studying, and it's been bouncing around in there. I've been learning a lot. It's a time that I think is one of the most intense times in the life of Christ. Uh, We know that Easter is coming upon us, and we're going to be celebrating His resurrection, what He has done through us in saving our souls in Jesus. But on the night that I'm looking at, the situation that I'm looking at is one of his final nights there that he was spending with his disciples and obviously decided where he was going to spend also with God because he decided to go and pray. And if you recognize the description, it's when he was in the garden that the disciples had gone in there with him. Uh, But it was a situation that was pretty intense. He knew where he was headed He knew what was coming. He knew what he was about to physically have to endure. And as a human being, I know a lot of times we talk about God being man and Jesus Christ. And I guess in my human perspective, it's hard for me to grasp that. Because I know he was perfect. I know know he was human. I don't doubt it. But to think of the strength that he had to make the decisions he had to, to live the life he lived that he didn't have much of an issue. But then I read situations like this, and I see what he was praying, and I know the feelings he was feeling because it describes him here. But the scripture that we're going to be looking at is out of Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. So if you have your copy of the scriptures, I would ask that you would open. Let's stand together to honor the reading of God's word. Beginning with verse 39, says, Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood, falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this scripture. I thank you for the opportunity to study it. Lord, I pray that you open our hearts and our minds for the message that you have for us. Lord, teach us to listen. Lord, we love you and thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, you know, I thought about an illustration about sleep or things like that. I'll share a little bit later about that. But I I thought, you know, as Jesus Christ is a man walking this earth in the situation He was in, He had spent His life in this ministry. He He had gone through this time and He was at a point that He knew was coming to an end here on earth. He knew what He was about to go through. He knew what was right in front of Him. And it created in Him feelings and obviously human feelings things we've all felt, things we've all thought about, things we've all gone through. So I think about as he's praying here and the things he's saying, I I can relate to this. I know what he's saying and I can see it. But as I'm praying and I'm thinking about these things, and I'll go ahead and tell you this. I've mentioned sometimes it's best we have a to-do list of prayer. We give God what we want done, and a lot of times we cut it off at that. A big part of our relationship with God and our time in prayer has to be giving Him the opportunity to show us, to help 
speak to us through His Spirit. So many times we talk about having friends, we see them coming, we know that typically the only time they call us or talk to us is when they need something. I wonder how many times God looks at us that way. Because there's so many things I know He wants us to understand and to grasp. And the only way that we get to that point is to spend time praying in quiet and listening and hearing God's Spirit. But as we go through these scriptures, there's a few points that I wanted to touch on, and then I'm going to look at this very same event in a different scripture that focuses on something a little different. But the first part of this, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. He was used to it. We talk about customs. When we talk about people and we talk about countries, I've heard people say, oh, their customs are amazing. What are their customs? The things that they do. It's who they are. It's how they spend their time. It's what they're known for. So this verse right here starts out telling us that this, is, this was Jesus. He was accustomed to spending time in prayer, face to face with God, listening, hearing, speaking, looking for an answer. And I think as an example, that's exactly what we need to grasp is, a, is that quiet time together. Allowing God to show us what He wants us to see, to know what He wants us to know, and to grasp it, to gain an understanding. So verse 39, prayer was His custom. But as He was going in verse 40, it says, The disciples followed Him. When He came to the place, He said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. My first thought here was, oh, so we're to pray that we don't sin. Let me pray about all the things that I might stumble about. Let me pray that I don't do this. God, keep me from these things. Help me to be aware, not make these decisions to fall into those temptations. But Jesus wasn't telling them to pray about those things. He wasn't telling them to pray about the sick. He wasn't telling them to pray about the homeless, the needy. He was telling them to pray, and, I, and I'm going to focus on this part of it here in a little bit. But that, the term, lest you fall into temptation. So I've told you already that I thought it meant pray not to sin, but that's not what I've kind of come to understand with it. But as he continues in the next verse, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. He prayed in private. He didn't do it for show. I love when we get together and pray as a group. We pray on Wednesday nights as a church. We we have prayer time, prayer meeting. We list a whole bunch. We have prayer lists that we pray together. We have special days of prayer. But I think about the time, each time that God calls us to have a prayer life that's private the things that I go before Him and He shows to me. It's not to be a show. He never meant for it to be a show. There are times that I am to hear God and focus on God and what He is telling me, and it's for no one else but me. There are times He does the same with you. There are things we understand. We can look at friends, we can look at co-workers, and we don't understand what they're going through but we see that God is blessing them and God is helping them to see it through because He's answering their prayers on a personal basis. And He does that. If we pray, God, what am I to to do? Who do I need to be? What example do I need to show? He's going to give us that understanding. Not on a billboard, not in a letter, but in a still small voice of His Spirit speaking to us. The Bible tells us that we are to pray without ceasing, pray continually. We should always be listening for God, for His Spirit, for what He wants us to hear. But He prayed in private, so it was one-on-one with God alone, and it was not for show. But the next part of that, and this is the one that I, I kind of have been grasping on. Verse 42, Father, if it is Your will... Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Three parts of this. Jesus asking if there's another way. 
How many of us have ever gone through something and we're praying, God, could you do something to take care of this? Could you get me out of this situation? I really don't want to be here. This hurts. I don't understand. I'm not sure why I'm going through this. Jesus was kind of praying and saying, Father, if there's another way, that's hard for me to think about and grasp because I know He knew what He was doing. I knew He knows why He was here. But I think He shows us the human part of Him right there saying, God, I want something different. I, want, don't, I don't want to have to go through this. I'm not sure I can go through this. But I'd rather it be Your will than something I want. So as we look at that, what He was saying and what He was looking for, God's plan can be difficult. There are some days when God has called you to be, to do, that we're in a difficult situation. It would not be our choice. Because there's things that go on that we'd probably rather be doing something else. But God calls us to make a stand. God calls us to make a statement. God calls us to be obedient. Because He's going to use the actions we take, the words we say to make a difference in what He wants us to be a difference in. God is at work in every one of us. Every day. Sometimes that's hard to grasp and hard to think about, but His his plan can be difficult. It can be overwhelming. I look back at some of the things that have taken place for family members in our church over the last year, and it's devastating. People were blindsided by things that took place and they felt overwhelmed at times. But no matter the situation, I watch and I see that step by step, day by day, God continues to bring them through. And His Word promises that He will not leave us, He will not forsake us. So a lot of things we are enduring, that we are going through, God is right there. So for us to think that we can be overwhelmed, yes, we can. But as we trust in God, He opens the doors and opens the path. For the third part of this, God's plan can't be upstaged. There is purpose in everything that we're going through. And now a lot of people talk about this and I hear questions, why did God make something happen? My answer would be that I don't think God makes it happen because He gives us choices, freedom of choice, that we can love Him, that we can be in that relationship with Him. And as a human being, we go through every day making the choices we can make. But the issues that take place and the things that happen are because of our choices. But the one thing that we can rely on and know that God's plan can't be upstaged, He can work through our choices. He can work through our situations and our tragedies to bring about what He desires for us to be and to have. For us to have that faith and to know that is when you see people overcoming these things. And God's being victorious in the lives of those people who at one time felt like they were crushed. God pulls us through. God continues to bring us along. So he, we ask, and Jesus even prayed, is there a different way? Is there a different path? If not, I'm all about your will. I wish we could live that way. Because we question to see what God can do, if God would change something. But I guarantee you, if you are going through something, there is a purpose. There is a reason. And as we see this verse as he continues here, Verse 43, Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. This is a whole different series of sermons, so I'm, not, I'm just going to mention this. Many times throughout Scripture, God sends angels. You can read in Scripture where God assigns angels to people to watch over them, to guide them, to protect them, to lead them. So to know that angels are at work around us, that there is a spiritual life going on around us where we're probably better off not knowing what all they've protected us from. But God is active and God is still day by day providing what we need. So I put God's provision of angels. 
If you continue to read there in verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. F, agony leads to earnest prayers. I know a lot of times we pray for things and we, and we put them on our to-do list. I shared earlier, I've probably got about 80 things listed right now that I pray for, whether it's people, events, our world, just different things. But we continue to pray for these things and we watch and see what God's doing. But as we see Jesus' example here, He said He was greatly distressed, He was in agony, His sweat became like drops of blood. You think He cared about what was going on? I think about the things that happen sometimes that cause agony in our lives. And like I said in the last year, I see things that people are knocked off their feet. But one thing I see them, I see a lot of people responding in earnest prayer. Because they're seeking to see what God wants them to be or where God wants them to go through the things that are taking place. We don't always understand, we don't always comprehend, but sometimes it just takes a faith to say, God's taking me somewhere. I'm going to hold His hand, I'm going to follow, and I'm going to see where I end up. Because God is a loving God and He's got a greater plan and He wants me to be with Him. But this leads us to the last part of this verse. And I think this is a lot where we can understand too. Verse 45. When He rose up from prayer and had come to His disciples, He found them sleeping from sorrow. Then He said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. He was so much in agony and praying and seeking and searching. And he came back to find them doing what? Sleeping. I think sometimes we get into this same situation and we can, we can understand where they're coming from. I wanted to look at this same story this same event out of Matthew. Matthew 26, 36 through 46, and I'm going to read through it just to hear something else he focused on. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took, him, took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed, then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words, then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of, hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the same event, talking about this same situation, but he focuses on something, and it, the idea that he went away three times. That it just wasn't once. That he went with a heart of agony, a heart of distress, to pray if there's another way. And he came back and they were asleep. And he told them, I want you to pray. And once again, he was talking about praying lest you fall into temptation. And the more I thought about this verse and this part of it and listening, 
It wasn't so much about who to pray for. It was just the idea that when we are praying to God, we are face to face with God, we won't be tempted. If we are before the Heavenly Father praying and interacting and communicating with God, we're not going to worry about what the world has to offer. We have a Heavenly Father that's overwhelming and amazing in all of His glory. And if we focus on Him and pray to Him and seek Him and His will, that's what we're going to be about. But our issue comes back to this very thing. First time he went away, second time he went away, third time he went away, he came back every time. And once again, he knew the time was near. All the time's gone by and we've reached the point that God put me here for. I'm about to go through something and I want you to pray for it. I want you to respond. I want you to pray with me. And every time they went away, to La La Land, whatever. They got sleepy, they got tired, they got worn out. And I thought about, as I was talking about earlier, you know, there's things that I wanted to say, talk about, you know, sleep habits. I've got a lot of interesting stories to tell you about sleep habits of my family members, but I'll try and protect us. (laughs) Except for one, because I think physically... It shows us how we are spiritually sometimes. There was one morning a few years back, I was sound asleep and I heard something and I opened my eyes and my daughter had walked in, walked over to me. And I asked her, I said, are you okay? I thought she was sick. She reared back and punched me in the stomach. (laughs) Turned around, went back to her bed and laid down, back to sleep. Now she still promises me she was sleepwalking. I'm wondering if she just took a free shot. (laughs) But with that thought of sleepwalking, what's sleepwalking look like? We still do the things we do in everyday life. I've heard stories of people getting up, going out and sitting in their car. People going down, fixing a meal, sitting down to eat. But they're sleeping. They're in their own state. They're in a state they don't know what they're doing. And I think, you know, physically, I see that. And unfortunately, spiritually, I think we do it too. I think sometimes God has called us to focus so much on the things that He's called us to, but we fall asleep. And we go through the motions. And we're just not as passionate. We don't have the feeling. We don't have the agony. We don't have the desperation to get to where God wants us to be. So we're sleepwalking spiritually. So the things that Jesus was praying about in this part, in this scripture, it said, what did Jesus continue to pray multiple times? He prayed about the situation. Is there a different way? Is there a different path? And each time I think he made the point, God, I understand if you're calling me to this, I'm all about God's will. I'm all about your will. I wish we could live our lives that way each day, that when God calls us to be the people He calls us to be, whether it be a church family or whether it be individuals. Our first thought is, God, I'm all about your will. It's not about my desires or my path or my journey. I understand it's going to take me places that I might not be able to handle all that well, but I'll have to believe in you and rely on you. But he told the disciples, continue praying. Why does he want you to continue praying? Not to pray, not to fall into sin, but to, just to be praying, be godly, be focused on the things of God. The Spirit is constantly going to be talking and sharing things with us if we're listening. So I think that whole part, that whole scripture that focuses on it was three times. And I think quite often we do it the same way. It's even more so. But I want to close with two other scriptures that I want to look at with just a couple of thoughts. Romans 13 verse 11 through 14 says, And do this, knowing the time that, knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast, cast off the works of darkness Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly 
as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the faith to fulfill its lust. Three things. The first one is wake up. I think too many of us continue to hit snooze buttons. Time and time and time again, God probably catches us sleeping. Time is passing. Time is the day, the days are spent. It's going by. I think about all the opportunities that I probably missed out on being something that God wanted me to be in someone's life because I was too busy napping spiritually because I've gotten in that situation. Second part of it, salvation is at hand, moving from the physical to the spiritual. We spend our lives worrying about some of the physical things in life, our jobs, our families, our situations, you know, whatever it is that the world wants us to focus on, and we have to give our time and our resources and our energy. And sometimes we are tired from focusing on the physical, and we fall asleep for the spiritual. There are spiritual things every moment of every day that God is calling us to. To sharing the gospel, to loving on people, to reaching people. But salvation is at hand, moving from the physical to the spiritual. The third part, our focus is to be on Christ, not the physical desires of the world. And what I mean by this, it sounds a lot like that other one, but I want us to think about this. Two weeks, we're celebrating Easter. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. He came to this world to take on the sin of all of us. Sin from before, sin from after, sin from now. He took sin upon Himself as the living sacrifice. He died. He was resurrected. They crucified Him. He knew what was coming and He lived it. So that He could take our sin. We celebrate that and we look at that now and we understand that the time is now. We need to get this message to people. There are some that are still spiritually sleeping. They have no clue. They're in a dreamland. And this leads me to the last verse I wanted to share. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may may be able to bear it. Once again, you get five more points quickly. Because I look at this, and I try and grasp this, and I think about it. But we think about our struggle. Your struggles are not uncommon. That part of the verse simply telling you the things that you've been blindsided with, that you've been knocked down, that you've fallen into, you're not alone. Other people have fallen in. Other people have been tempted. We've talked about Jesus praying today. We've talked about falling asleep. And we've talked about being tempted. And He's, he's bringing all this together right here. All these things that you've faced... Your struggles are not uncommon. I talked about sharing my testimony. I don't have a wild testimony. I grew up in church. I tried to make my parents happy. I've never been in prison. I've never joined a gang. I've never done a lot of these things that I hear testimonies thinking, yeah, Jesus brought them back. But I also know in my own experience that my own situation was very dangerous too because I always thought, you know, I've not done anything that bad. I'm a pretty good person. I can probably just be a good person right into heaven. We all know what happens there. We are born with sin. The things that we do are a result of that sin. Even if we don't do that, that sin's still there. We were born with sin. So Jesus had to do what Jesus did. But the second part of that is as God is faithful. Through everything you're going through, through everything you've dealt with, God is faithful. He's not going to leave you alone. He's not going to say, you know, you did that yourself. He's going to bring us back. He's going to have an opportunity for us to get back. You're never too far gone. 
The fourth part of this, and I want us to understand this, God has provided a way back. I'm going to give you something I still try and grasp every day as a minister. The Bible tells us God wants us to be holy. He wants us to be righteous, perfect. But the Scripture tells us how many are righteous, how many are perfect. Jesus Christ made it. The rest of us fall flat. But what we need to understand, and Jesus also gave us this example. God has provided the way back. He provides a way out. Every temptation we face, Jesus showed us the way out. Jesus never fell. He was perfect. He always had a pathway out of a sin. So with any temptation that comes our way, there is an opportunity to follow God. Have you ever thought about that? When temptation hits hard, one of the responses can be, God is glorified. So when we understand that and grasp that, it helps us with this last point. And I'll close with this. You can return to the person God created you to be. God created us to have a relationship with Him. He loves us. We love Him. That's why we're here. Sin stepped in. Fallen man is dealing with what he's dealt with, but Jesus came to deal with that. So just like He offered a way out of temptation, He offered a way out of sin. That's what we're celebrating in two weeks with Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior forever. My hope that through this message and through the messages you'll hear in the future, through your words spoken, through people loving on you, if you've not come to the realization of a need of Jesus Christ and what that means, my prayer is that God will draw you close to Him. Because these scriptures talk about it, and I, and I still... Jesus walking as a man on the, that night, praying before God and telling others, don't fall into sin. Don't be tempted. Focus on the things of God. That's what I want to share today. Jesus Christ came that we could focus on the things of God and live the life He called us to live. We were meant to be something when God created us. And Jesus brought us back to what we were meant to be if we accept Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for this Scripture. I thank You for the opportunity to study. And Lord, I do pray that we continue to listen. Not only now, but in the days ahead. That You're always helping us to understand, to know, to see. Lord, help us to grasp. Our minds are so small and sometimes we struggle, but if we have a faith to believe in You and to know that Your plan is coming about, Lord, we can celebrate wholeheartedly. And Lord, not fall asleep, but focus on the things of the Spirit that you want us to focus on and to focus on Jesus Christ that others may know. Lord, help us to share this message that those in the dark can see the light and come to know Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to take an opportunity to have a moment of invitation. The altar is open. If you would like to come forward and pray, Altar's yours. If you would like to come forward and pray with someone, I will be down here. If uh, you stay where you are, what I, I would ask you to continue to pray. Just like Jesus said in the garden, the reason we pray is to focus on the things of God. And I think if we do that, we're going to be heading in a great direction. So let's stand together during this time. We'll sing together and pray together. Please stand. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.